your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Knowing the Son. And in recent programs, we've been examining the humanity of Jesus. He came into this world. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And that's the amazing, wonderful doctrine of the Christian faith, that the Son of God, though being of the very nature God, came to this world to show us what God was like. It's an amazing revelation. That's why Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the full revelation of the Father. Now, also, we've been looking at what it means to understand Jesus as divine, as fully God. In fact, Jesus was as fully man as though he had never been God, but he remained as fully God as though he never became man. We hold these two truths together, and we find it in John's Gospel, chapter 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This teaches us about Jesus' relationship with the Father. He always was with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He was in this amazing relationship of unity, of love and communion with the Father from all eternity. But it also tells us that Jesus is the one by whom God created the world. The Bible says that God used the Word, His Word, to create everything, and that everything is created by His Word, showing us that the Word is not created. The Word is eternal. Jesus Christ is the eternal Word of God. But it also shows us that Jesus has a relationship with humanity. The Bible says the Word of God dwelt amongst us, and the word that is used there is the word to pitch your tent. He pitched his tent amongst us. He made his home amongst us. And that shows us that God now has an amazing relationship with humanity. He is not this distant God that doesn't have anything to do with this world. He is not infinitely removed and out of this world, meaning that he cannot identify with you and me. He came in the person of Jesus Christ to sit where you and I sit. He experienced all the things that we experienced. He suffered the way we suffer. He was tempted the way we are tempted and yet without sin. That's why we can celebrate Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the one who came into this world. So we're going to explore more about what it means as Jesus being divine. Hello and welcome to this teaching series in the Sword of the Spirit entitled Knowing the Son. We've been looking at the wonderful person of the Lord Jesus Christ, looking at his humanity, finding that he is exactly human and totally human, as though he were never God. But as soon as we discover that, we discover also that he is God, God manifest in the flesh. He is so fully God as though he were never man. But the fact is he is both the God-man, Christ Jesus, the Word become flesh, and therefore he qualifies to be our Savior and our help. We've been looking at his divinity in the last session, touching on John's Gospel, which really shows us the divinity of Jesus in a very, very clear way. It begins with that wonderful statement, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we read a little way down in the chapter that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's none other than Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God. And so, in the titles that the New Testament uses to describe Jesus, we find four of them which are used commonly to relate more specifically to his humanity, Jesus the Christ and Jesus the Son of Man, and the other two relate to his divinity, the Son of God and Lord. So we've been looking at Logos, which helps us begin to grasp Jesus as the divine Son of God. And then we also look at how John begins to use some very dramatic statements to show us that Jesus is God. These are the I am sayings. John's gospel uses I more than any other gospels. For example, uh, in, uh, he uses I, the Greek words 
ego 134 times. Whereas uh, in Mark's gospel, Matthew's gospel is 29, Mark's gospel it's 17, and Luke's gospel it is 23 times. And this, what John does to attract, his, attract people's attention to the Son, ego, speaking of Jesus, when Jesus says, I, 134 times. That's quite a dramatic statistic. And he also does it to prepare us for the emphatic personal pronoun. That's the grammatical form of ego eimi. That's in the Greek, meaning I am, I am. And John uses this to stress the Son's full divinity. Jesus has a series of I am sayings in John's Gospel. And it's, these sayings are important because they are a repeat of a phrase used in the Old Testament relating to God's personal name. In Exodus chapter 3, I am. Moses said to God, if I go and tell them, they're going to say, what's the name of the God who's revealed himself? What's your name? And he said, tell them, I am what I am. Exodus 3 and verse 14. And so for the Jews, this phrase is invested with very special divine significance. And so where Jesus says, I am, he seems to be uh, drawing on this content and this revelation of Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. Let's have a look at some of these, uh, well, let's have a look at all of the I am sayings of Jesus in John's gospel. John 6 and verse 35, I am the bread of life. John 8 verse 12, I am the light of the world. John 10 and verse 7, I am the door of the sheep. John 10 and verse 11, I am the good shepherd who gives his life. John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine. Now, in every case, the I am saying reveals a different divine function of Jesus. And we find him here sustaining, illuminating, admitting care for, for ad admitting, caring for, caring for sacrificially, giving new life, guiding, and making reproductive. These are staggering claims. The first introduced in John's Gospel, these kind of uh, themes, light, guidance, and so forth. And uh, through these I am sayings, the seven sayings, Jesus makes personal what is declared there in theory in the prologue of John's Gospel. He reveals himself to be the divine embodiment of everything that people seek. And so, some leaders suggest that the I am sayings are only a kind of emphatic self-identification, while others say, no, this is just John's way of using the phrase, it's similar to the kingdom of God is like. Um, but you know, when you read carefully what Jesus says, you find that there's something stronger than just some phrase which is, which is convenient as a shorthand for, for, uh, for the kingdom of God or, or some kind of emphatic way of drawing attention to himself. In John 6 verse 20, for example, Jesus said, It is I. Do not be afraid. I mean, that's a very powerful statement. John 8 verse 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Um, and so there seemed to be a very clear way in which these I am sayings bring you to the recognition that Jesus is more than a man and that he is somehow identified with God, and we're going to come to that. In John 8, verses 57 and 58, it says, Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, this is a staggering claim because for the Jews to look back to their roots of, in Abraham and to say, this is amazing, we are children of Abraham. And then Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. And they said, Abraham saw your day? You're not even 50 years old and you are older than Abraham? They're making fun of him. And he said, I want you to know. Before Abraham was, I am. And they immediately knew that Jesus was saying something that they considered to be blasphemous. In other words, this was a very staggering claim and not one that you should make unless it's true. 
And so they took up stones to kill him. They understood Jesus as using this phrase, I am, uh, uh, in the sense of Exodus 3. And uh, that they knew that uh, Jesus was saying something very, very special and spectacular. Now, many of them rejected it, and they wanted to stone him for it. But we must grasp that when Jesus says, I am, he is conveying to the people that he carries in his person all the attributes of God himself that he is claiming to be divine. And you see, when we use this word, I am, it's the powerful revelation, not just of Jesus' identity, but of his mission and authority. Because this I am is not just a label, it's a nature. And out of that nature flows everything that God wants us to have and everything that is God that he offers to us. And so when Jesus describes himself as I am the door, I am the bread of life and so forth, I am the light of the world, he is describing divine functions which have been uh, imparted to us and, and revealed to us through his divine person. So John's gospel reveals Jesus as the great I am. Then the New Testament describes Jesus as the Lord, the Lord. The Greek word kurios, Lord, has many uses in the New Testament world. For example, it was a term of general respect, just like you might say, excuse me, sir, can you mind moving this way? Or it was a courtesy title used for superior. If your boss was there, you'd call him sir or, or lord. It was also an official title of the Roman emperor. Lord. And also, you, they were addressed Roman gods as lords. So we have all of this use. The ordinary title, sir, referring to superior, also referring to uh, the uh, Roman emperor, and referring to, to pagan gods. But for the Jews, kurios, or lord, had a very special meaning. It was the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Adonai which was a word for God, one of God's root names, which was commonly used instead of Yahweh or Jehovah. And so they would not use the divine sacred name, so they'd use the word Adonai instead. So when somebody used the word Lord, it could translate Adonai, which stood for Yahweh. So there's a connection between Lord and Jehovah or Yahweh. 